All right, can you hear me all right? Yep. All right, I'm going to stay away from that and see if that helps a little bit. Um, all right, so uh, for the presentation for the smaller people that we're going to start with, we're going to have lots of questions. So you ready to answer questions? Yes. Apparently not. Okay. <laughs> So, what's the first thing you noticed about me? Raise your hand and tell me the first thing you noticed about me. Go ahead, right here. I like pink. All right, somebody else. What's the first thing you noticed about me? Right there. I'm tall. Okay, so we got two out of the three. I'm looking for one more. Go ahead, my man in the back. Did I have glasses? Did I have glasses? That's a good one. All right, what else? Go ahead. Beard. Did I have a beard? Nice work. Go ahead. That I have hair. <laughs> Do you have a bald dad? Do you have a bald dad? Go ahead. I'm skinny. I like that. I like this guy, Davis. He's my new friend. I'm skinny. I like that. Other people, go ahead. Your shirt says freak. My shirt says freak. Anything else about what the shirt says? It's upside, it's upside down, right? So now notice this. Okay, I just asked you that. I don't know you. I didn't ask you to say those things. But I had to make these slides ahead of time, and I knew that people would say that I was tall that I wore a lot of pink, and that my shirt has letters upside down. Right? How did I know that? I know that because the first thing we notice about people is what? What's different about them, right? What's different about them? And so that's part of what I want to talk about, uh, part of what I want to talk about today. So you don't have to answer this question, but this is what I want, to, want you to think about is, what's the first thing that people notice about you, right? What's the first thing that people notice about you, and do you like what they notice about you? Or are you concerned that they notice something about you that's different and that that's not good, right? So be thinking about that. So I want you to look at this guy here. His name is Matt Stutzman. I want somebody to tell me what's different about Matt Stutzman. Do you notice anything unusual about Matt Stutzman? Go ahead, up front here. He doesn't have arms. So Matt Stutzman was born without arms. He doesn't have arms on either side. But what's he doing here? Does anybody know what this is called? Somebody tell me what this is called. Go ahead. He's doing archery. What does it seem like you really need to be able to do archery? So you really need arms, right? You hold it with this arm, you pull it with this arm. So here's a guy with no arms, and he's doing archery. Now it might be easy to think, well, he's probably not very good at it because he doesn't have arms. So here's an interesting thing about Matt Stutzman. Matt Stutzman doesn't have arms, and he won a silver medal in the Paralympics for people with disabilities for archery. And you might be like, okay, well, he went against other people who have disabilities. He didn't go against regular people, so he's not that good. Here's a more interesting fact about Matt Stutzman. He has no arms, and if you did a Google search for who has the record for the longest, most accurate shot in archery in the world, it's Matt Stutzman. Matt Stutzman has no arms, and he's better at a sport that really seems to require arms than anybody else in the entire world. Matt and I got to meet at an event where we both spoke because he is an example of what I talk about. The person who organized it was smart enough to see that and bring us together. And I said, Matt, is it a good thing to not have arms in archery? Now that sounds like a stupid question, doesn't it? But I knew the answer and he said, absolutely, it's a good thing. I said, explain to me why it's a good thing. He said, because I use my leg to hold the bow and my leg is bigger and stronger than anybody's arm could ever be. So I'm immediately stronger than anybody I'm competing against because I'm using my leg and they're using their arm. And no matter how big somebody gets, their arm is never going to be stronger than their leg. So I have a huge advantage because I don't have arms. And he said, and then I connect the other part of the bow to my shoulder, which uses my back muscles and my core muscles, and those are bigger and stronger than anybody's arm could ever be. And so I have an advantage, so I have more strength, so I have more stability, so I have more accuracy. It's good to not have arms. That doesn't seem like what I would be telling you today, right? It wouldn't seem good to not have arms, but Matt's found an advantage. So much so that now he trains other people who don't have arms to do archery and shows them how it's a huge advantage. They actually tried to keep him out of the 2016 Rio Olympics. He wanted to compete against people with arms, and they said it was no fair. He had an unfair advantage. <laughs> Think about how crazy this is, and this is what I want to show you today. The things that makes you different is the thing that makes you amazing and makes you wonderful. And it's oftentimes something that we try to hide, and we see it as a bad thing. And then obviously, and that's why I start with Matt Sussman, it seems like a bad thing to not have arms in it. He found out it's fantastic. Now, we found out on accident. He got a bow and arrow because he had a wife and he had kids, 
And he didn't have a job because he didn't have arms and nobody wanted to hire somebody without arms. So he got a bow and arrow so he could kill some animals so he could feed his family. That was his original reason for getting a bow and arrow. And then he discovered that he was really, really good at something that you'd think he'd be really, really bad at because he found there was a strength, there was something good hiding inside of something that was obviously bad. I asked him, I said, Matt, how long have you been training to become the best in the world at archery? He said, four years. I said, when you beat people, how long have they been training? He said, their whole life. They've been training for 20 years, 30 years, and I got better than them in four years. I had a special advantage, and this is what I want to show you today, but it looked like a disadvantage. I found something amazing, but it looked like something terrible. So when I was a kid, one of the things that I didn't like about me is that I had something called a colic. What a colic means is that your hair sticks up, it doesn't want to come down. And the problem was we were poor, and so we didn't get professional haircuts. My mom cut our hair with like sewing scissors or something. And so my mom would just get my hair wet, and she would comb it down, and she would cut it straight across, which was fine while it was wet. But as soon as it dried, it would just go up completely on the one side, as you can see, be wide open, and then it would go down on the other side. But I'm still pretty cute here, and I'm a little kid, so you're thinking it's not that bad. And you're also thinking your mom figured it out. She got better. Practice makes perfect. But she did it, right? She did it. <laughs> She didn't figure it out. Now, my jacket game is strong in this particular situation. I'm going to give you gels to that. But as you can see, it's not only way down on the one side and way up on the other side, it's also very jagged. Not a great job. But you're thinking, okay, you're still pretty young there, and you're still fairly cute, it's still working for you, although it's like half of male pattern baldness, you know, right away as a kid. Uh, but she didn't get any better. Uh, and, and now. And now we've added buck teeth, right? And a three piece polyester suit. And so when I was a kid, and it's part of the reason I do this presentation, all I wanted to be was normal. I wanted to be like the other kids. I wanted to have what the other kids had. I wanted to look like the other kids. I didn't want to be different. I didn't want to stick out. I didn't want to get teased. I didn't want to get bullied. I didn't want to be weird. The last thing on earth I wanted to be was weird. I just wanted to be normal. Now, does anybody know who this guy is? Michael Strahan. How many of you like football? Raise your hand if you like football. Raise your hand if you like football. We got Titans fans, raise your hand if you're Titans fans, all right? So this guy played for the New York Giants, and he was a very good football player, one of the best, won the Super Bowl, set a lot of records, he played defense. Um, and then he got to be on television and, and announcing games on Sundays, and then he got on shows like Today, the Today Show and Good Morning America. Does anybody know anything different about this guy? If you're a kid, raise your hand, tell me if you know anything different about this guy. Go ahead. His teeth are pretty spread apart, right? How many of you either have had braces or you know at some point you're going to get braces? Now this guy played NFL football. He made millions of dollars. How many of you think he could afford braces? But he didn't get braces, did he? Because what he knows is there's a lot of ex-football players out there. And one of the things that makes him special is everybody recognizes him because you could drive a car through the gap in his team. <laughs> He could fix this, and people have told him over and over he should fix this, and he deliberately doesn't fix this, because he realizes that what makes him weird makes him wonderful, that a thing that seems bad is actually good, this makes him recognizable and memorable. They went to pick me up today from the front entrance and bring me over in a little golf cart, because they wanted to make sure I got over here and got the sound check. Do you think I was hard to find in the parking lot of the zoo? <laughs> Right? When I order an Uber and then they're like, they're like, hey, I'm here, I'm just like, I'm 6'6", six, six, pink pants, and they're like, you got it. Right? There's no confusion about what happened. He's very recognizable, he's made it very successful. What you notice too is he's also smiling in this picture. And if you know anything about Michael Strahan, he's always smiling, but you'd think if you had teeth like that, you'd do what? You'd be one of those people who's like, but he doesn't. He's not ashamed of who he is. He's not trying to hide the thing that makes him different. That's part of what I want to tell you today. Regardless of your age, don't hide what's different about you because what makes you weird makes you wonderful. So I have three daughters. Um, I have three daughters. They're 17, 15, and 12. Uh, those are weird names, but we really like them. And one of the interesting things about living in a house of all women is they're trying to turn me into a woman. Right? They don't ever just come out and say that they want me to be a girl, but they're always trying to turn me into a girl. And so since they're trying to make me a girl, I fight back and I try to turn them into men. Right? I try to turn them into men. And so I had a success the other day. I was sitting on the couch with my middle daughter. She's Emma. Her name's Emma. And she was all the way on the other side of the couch. She was on her iPad. How many of you have iPads? Right? She's all the way on the other side of her couch on the iPad. And I was watching TV and she came over and she sat on my lap. 
And I was like, oh, awesome, because Emma's the middle one in my family, and I'm the middle one growing up in the family I grew up in. And Emma's athletic, and I'm athletic, and she's kind of snuggly, and I'm kind of snuggly, so we got a special connection. And she came over, and she sat down on my lap, and I'm like, all right, it's a little snuggle time with my daughter watching a little TV on a Sunday afternoon. But after two seconds, she's off my lap, and she's not even next to me. She's all the way on the other side of the couch back on her iPad. I was disappointed. I was like, hey, what's going on? I thought we were going to have some snuggle time. And she looked up and she goes, I farted on you. <laughs> that's when I knew I was making a difference, right? That's when I knew that my life mattered. That's leadership. <laughs> that's leadership, right? But I want you to think about the beginning of that story. Because I'm the only guy in the house, even our dog's a girl. It's a B-shot for Zay. And even if it wasn't a girl, it's a girl, right? A B-shot for Zay. It's a girl, whether it's male or female. And so everything at my house is female. One of the reasons I wear pink is as a representation of the females that I live with. But remember what I said, when you're different, everybody wants to make you more like them, right? And the temptation is to become more like them. And I tell that as a silly story. But it is important that instead of giving in when people are giving you pressure to be like them, to be yourself and don't be ashamed of who you are. So a great example of this is Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. How many of you ever seen the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer like movie at Christmas time, right? How many of you know the song? Do you know the song? All right, so I'm gonna need you to fill in the blanks with me, okay? So I'm not gonna sing, you don't wanna hear that, but I'm gonna say some of the words, then I want you to say the rest of the words. So Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Has a very shiny nose. Nice, so let's just stop there. <laughs> Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer has a very shiny nose. Ray Rudolph's not real, we know that, or at least some of you do. Sorry if I just broke something down for some of you folks here. <laughs> Rudolph's not real, but reindeer are real. Is it normal for deer to have red noses? No. No. So Rudolph's got something weird about him, right? Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer had a very shiny nose. And if you ever saw it? Nice job. I like it. Somebody's singing it. Very nice. So it's not just red, it's glowing. Now in the movie, how did his parents and how did Santa respond to his red nose? Did they say, oh, that's amazing and that's wonderful? How cool that Rudolph has a red nose? Is that what happened? Yeah. No. What happened? They tried to cover it up, didn't they? They tried to hide it. They put like mud or something on it. I lost a little respect for Santa when that happened. That kind of bothered me a little bit. But let's keep going. He, he, if you ever saw it, you would even say it glows. All of the other reindeer used to laugh and call him names. When you're weird, what are we afraid of? That people are going to laugh and call us names. And that's what happened to Rudolph. All the other reindeer used to laugh and call him names, and they didn't just laugh and call him names. All of the other reindeer wouldn't let him join in any of the reindeer games. So not only did they make fun of him, they didn't let him play with them, and even the adult reindeer didn't want him hanging out with their girl reindeer. And I can understand that as a dad of girls, but we're not going to get into that right now. <laughs> So not only did he get teased and get made fun of, people didn't want him to play with them. This isn't going very well, and this is the reason we don't want to be weird and we don't want to be different. We want to be liked, we want to be accepted, we want to have friends, we want to be able to hang out with the other kids. So all of the other reindeer used to laugh and call him names. They never let poor Rudolph join in any reindeer games. But the story's about to change here. And listen to what happens. Then one foggy Christmas Eve, Rudolph with your nose so bright. Well, let's just stop right there. Bright Was bright a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing? It was a good thing. Why was it a good thing? It was a good thing because then one foggy Christmas Eve. And this is what I want you to think about. The situation changed, and now it got foggy, and now what was weird and bad about Rudolph turned into something good. Then one foggy Christmas Eve, Santa came to say, Rudolph, with your nose so bright. So people used to make fun of him and exclude him. And if he would have fixed it, he wouldn't have been able to help on that foggy Christmas Eve. If he would have done something about it, gotten a nose job at the plastic surgeons, he wouldn't have been able to help on Christmas Eve. When the situation changed, people started looking at him differently. When I was a kid, I wished I wasn't different and now, as you can obviously see, I'm not afraid of being different. When I was a kid, I thought different was bad, and now I realize different was good. When you're in different situations, people see the unique things about you differently. Then one foggy Christmas Eve, Santa came to say, we're up with your nose so bright, won't you? Won't you guide my slate tonight? Now they weren't making fun of Rudolph. They weren't excluding him. They put him at the head of the whole sleigh. They put him in charge of everything. Rudolph saved Christmas. 
Then when Foggy Christmas Eve, Santa came to say, Rudolph, with your nose so bright, won't you guide my sleigh tonight? Then all the reindeer. Look at that. Even everybody else realized by the end that the thing that made him weird made him wonderful. And the thing that seemed to be wrong with him was actually fantastic. Just like Matt Stutzman. Just like Michael Strahan. Just like you. We need to see this because we live in a world where we know the first part of the story, but we oftentimes don't know the second part of the story. We know you can get made fun of, you can get bullied, you can get teased, and sometimes we're even the ones doing it to other people because we think weird is bad and we wish they were more like us. But there's another part of the story. Won't you guide my sleigh tonight? Then all the reindeer loved him, and they shouted out with glee, Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer, you'll go down in history. It wasn't just that they loved him, we're still talking about the story years and years later because the people who really matter in this world are people who aren't afraid to be different. The people who we admire, the people who we look up to, the people who we respect, the people who we talk about are the people who aren't ashamed of being different. So what I want you to remember today, and I'll say this over and over again, is that what makes us weird also makes us wonderful, and what makes us weak also makes us strong. What I love is at some point, if a kid came up to you at school and said, you are so weird, if you could just go, thanks. And that's not always what happens, right? Because a lot of times when people say you're weird, do they mean that as a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah. They oftentimes mean it as a bad thing. But that's what I'm trying to show you today. It's actually wonderful to be weird, and that's one of the reasons I wear pink pants. That's one of the reasons I have pink glasses. There's one other person here with pink glasses, and it's a girl who's how many years old? Eight, so I have the same fashion sense as an eight-year-old girl, right? That's weird, right? That's weird. When I'm at events, there's oftentimes women who are dressed like me, pink pants and a black shirt. There's never guys dressed like me. But I'm doing that on purpose because I recognize the value of that, the value of being different, the value of standing up. So it makes us weird, makes us wonderful, but also the things that make us weak, the things we think are wrong with us. Matt's husband didn't have arms. But that actually makes him the best at something in the entire world because he found out there's something amazing about being different. How many of you have seen the new Dumbo movie? Have you seen the new Dumbo movie? Dumbo has ears that are really, really big, and that doesn't seem good. And they made fun of him for being weird, and he was ashamed of being weird. What was his secret superpower that he had, though, because he had those big ears? Go ahead, tell me. He flies, right? The one next to you was showing us, right? He can fly, right? He can fly. Can other elephants fly? No. He had a superpower because of the thing that people said was wrong with him that was weird about him. And this is the thing. We see this in a lot of children's stories, but sometimes when we go to school, and definitely when we grow up and go to work, we start to think this isn't true anymore when it absolutely is. Oftentimes, the thing that people make fun of you for is oftentimes the best thing about you. So what makes us weird makes us wonderful, and what makes us weak also makes us strong. Does anybody know who this guy is? Kind of hard to see because he's all wet. Go ahead. Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps nailed it. Unicorns are her spirit animal. I love your shirt. I love that, right? So uh, does anybody know the unicorn is the national animal of what country? Does anybody know? Yeah. Go ahead. Ireland. Close. Scotland. Scotland. Nailed it, right? Nailed it. All right. So this is Michael Phelps. Michael Phelps has won more Olympic medals than anybody in the history of the Olympics. He's won more gold medals than anybody in the history of the Olympics. He's better at swimming than anybody we've ever known. Does anybody know something that was wrong with Michael Phelps, something that he had trouble with? ADHD. Yeah, he had ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. How many, some, how many, how many kids in this room, raise your hand if anybody's ever told you you're hyperactive or you need to learn to sit still? Raise your hand if that's ever happened. <laughs> So they told Michael Phelps he was hyperactive. They diagnosed him with ADHD. They told him to his mom, something's wrong with your kid and we need to give him medicine to fix it. And you know what his mom did instead? She said, wait a second. If he's hyperactive, what if we get him involved in athletics? Because no coach has ever sent a kid home from sports practice and said, oh my gosh, your kid just won't stop with the running and the running and the running. <laughs> He's so hyper, if you could just get him to calm down, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> so she got him involved in sports, and now we don't call him hyperactive, we call him disciplined, we call him determined, we call him dominant, because he's in a situation that rewards him for being unusual. 
that rewards them for being more active than your average person. Even the other very good swimmers would only get swim six days a week, and he'd swim seven days a week. The other swimmers would swim eight or nine hours, he would swim nine or ten hours. He always did more, and he also, we don't have time for this, but he had the perfect body for swimming. His legs were a little shorter, his arms were a little bit longer, I'm all legs, he was all upper body. His legs are the same length as an Olympic marathon runner. He's got tiny little legs, big long arms, he's perfectly designed for swimming. So what makes us weird makes us wonderful, and what makes us weak also makes us strong. But think back to that. When somebody tells you you've got ADD, if somebody tells your parents there's something wrong with you, you've got ADD, you're not going to think, oh, that's wonderful. And that's why I try to share these examples, because he's not the only one. There's a guy named Peter Shankman who's a successful entrepreneur, just like a lot of your parents. He started and sold a number of businesses, and he has ADHD, and he just wrote a book called Faster Than Normal. And the whole book is about how awesome it is to have ADD, and how he uses it to be successful. And I guarantee a few of your parents in this room have some ADD, whether they tell you about it or not. Okay? So what makes us weird also makes us wonderful. What makes us weak also makes us strong. And so one of the things I sent around uh, to your parents, and some of you I know did it, is we sent an assessment. So if you're like, well, I don't know what's this good and bad thing about me, you can take the assessment, look at your strengths, the good things about you, look at your weaknesses, the bad things about you, and see how they're connected, see how they're related, see how the things that you might be uh, upset about are actually positive things um, about you. So for me, I was always in trouble when I was a kid. I was in trouble at school and at home for three things. I couldn't sit still, I couldn't be quiet, and I wouldn't do what I was told. Do you think my parents liked that very much? No. They did not like that very much. My teachers did not like that very much either, did they? So my teachers called me obnoxious, rebellious, and inappropriate, and immature, and told me I had no self-discipline and no self-control, and if I didn't fix those things, I was going to end up homeless and living in a van down by the river. Right? <laughs> I didn't even know what any of those words meant because I was a little kid, but I knew I was in trouble and my parents even had a nickname for me, they called me Motor Mouth. And their goal in calling me Motor Mouth was to remind me that I needed to learn to shut it off, I needed to learn to be quiet. My biggest problem, my parents thought, was the fact that I couldn't be quiet. The biggest problem my teachers saw was that I couldn't be quiet. Now, only the kids, I want you to guess, can anybody guess how it became a good thing that I like to talk? Go ahead. Sometimes people do comedy, that's a good point. What else? Go ahead. I can do big speeches, right? My job is called a professional speaker. This is all I do. People pay me to talk. Sometimes people don't get that. I was actually at an EO event years ago, a regional event, and I was sitting around like a lunch table with eight other people, and a guy across the table said, hey, uh, Dave, uh, what do you do? I said, uh, I'm a speaker. He said, yeah, I know you're speaking at this event. He goes, what do you do? I said, uh, I'm a speaker. <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, but what's your business? And I said, well, apparently I'm not very good at my business because I can't help you understand. I said, uh, when I say the words, they give me the money, right? I don't know how clear to be, right? And so my whole life, people told me that the only way I'd be successful is if I would shut up and sit down and stop goofing around. And now people pay me to stand up, they pay me to talk, and to tell stories about my daughter farting on me. Right? <laughs> all those things that were bad about me are all the things that are good about me, and I pay my bills, I buy my house, I buy my cars, I pay for my kids to go to school, I buy their clothes that, with money that people give me for doing the thing that people spend their whole life telling me was the biggest, worst problem that I have. And that's where I learned this lesson about Matt Stutzman and, and Michael Phelps and Michael Strahan is I realized at some point that the other people were wrong. People were missing that weird was wonderful, that weakness was strength. And that's what I want you to see. When you look at other people, when you look at your friends, when you look at the kids at school, when you look at your brothers and sisters, it's easy to see what's wrong with them, right? Lots of things are wrong with them. I want you to wonder if there's something better. Now, there's another part. They called me hyperactive when I was a kid. We'd already talked about this. Some of you have been called hyperactive. So now I do something called Ironman triathlons. Any of the kids know what an Ironman triathlon is? Go ahead, neck in the striped shirt there. Um, it's basically where you swim. Say it as loud as you can. <laughs> it's basically where you swim. 
you then run, and then you, or you swim, bike, and then run. Swim, bike, and run. Okay, go ahead. You have more information you want to add. He did 50 in 50 states in 50 days. Yep, his name is uh, James Lawrence. I'm not that good. So, <laughs> but I did an Ironman triathlon. I did swimming. She's right. It starts with 2.4 miles of swimming. Then you do 112 miles of biking. Just to give you a sense for you kids, you're like, I don't know what miles mean. That's like riding the bike from here to your house, then back to here, then back to your house, then back to here, and then maybe back again. And then when you're done, you run a marathon at the end. So like right now, in Nashville this weekend, they did the marathon. When you do an Ironman triathlon, you run a marathon after you swim 2.4 miles and bike 112 miles. My first one took me 16 hours and 15 minutes. How many of you have exercised for 16 hours and 15 minutes in a row without stopping? So I did that, and what did people tell me when I finished that? People sent me text messages and Facebook messages and left me voicemail messages. They said, wow, that's amazing that you did an Ironman triathlon. They were praising me and rewarding me for being very, very, very active, which is interesting. Because when I was a kid, and you're very, very, very active, what do people call you? They call you hyperactive, and they give you medicine that's supposed to fix it. So my whole life I got criticized and punished for being hyperactive, and now as an adult people tell me, wow, that's amazing, that's fantastic. And so that's what I'm trying to show you, is that you need to be open to this idea that those things that make you weird might be wonderful, the things that make you weak might also make you strong. What makes us weird also makes us wonderful, what makes us weak also makes us strong. Um, how many have ever heard of dyslexia? Has anybody ever heard of dyslexia? Go ahead. I haven't heard from you yet. Yep. Can you talk just a little louder, Caroline? It's where you can't read. Okay. You can't read, and do you know why? What happens when people try to read with dyslexia? Do you know? Go ahead. Um, That's okay. Davis is my man here. You switch up the letters and switch up the words, right? So dyslexia, if you have dyslexia, you're going to struggle to read and write, which is what Caroline said. And, and, and so then you're going to have trouble in school, and that seems obviously bad, right? It seems bad to have dyslexia. But how many of you ever been to an Ikea with your parents? You probably hated it. You went to Ikea with your parents, right? So <laughs> Ikea is a very successful company. It was started by a guy in Sweden. His name's Ingvar Kamprad, and he had dyslexia. So he's a billionaire. Your parents are trying to be billionaires. They're not there yet. He's a billionaire. He's a billionaire, started his own company. He has dyslexia. So think about that. He has something that keeps him from reading and writing very well, which is something that made him struggle in school. So he didn't do very well in school, but then as an adult, he became a billionaire and started his own business. This guy's name is Richard Branson. Sometimes people think he looks a little funny. Uh, he runs a bunch of companies. He's a billionaire, and here's what he said about his dyslexia. He said, strangely, I think my dyslexia has helped. So dyslexia is a disability, and some people discover they have dyslexia in school, and they think, oh, there's something wrong with me. I'm broken. But there's a lot of billionaires with dyslexia, and what scientists are starting to figure out is that dyslexia causes kids to struggle in school, but it often causes them to do better in life than most other people will. That they don't have a broken brain, they have a different brain, and the same brain that causes them to struggle in school causes them to do well in the rest of their life. This guy's name is Paul Orfala. He had dyslexia and ADHD, so he had two disabilities together. He got kicked out of four different high schools, and then he couldn't get into college. And he couldn't get a job. So his parents were entrepreneurs, just like yours. So he went to work for family-owned businesses. And then his own parents fired him from the businesses. So it was too bad to even keep a job with his own family. That's hard to be that bad. So he started his own company called Kinko's. And he recently sold it to FedEx for $2.4 billion. And he said this. He said, I think everyone should have dyslexia. Now think about that. He sees his weakness as so strong, his weirdness as so wonderful, he wishes you had what was wrong with him. They asked him if you could give him a pill that would cure his dyslexia, would he take it? And he said, absolutely not. And I think he's secretly working on a pill that gives us dyslexia. <laughs> All right, this guy's name is Matthias Schlitt. It's kind of dark, it's kind of hard to see. Does anybody see anything weird with Matthias Schlitt? Let's give a look over here. What do you got? Say that again? Yeah, well, that's an interesting, yeah. He has a gigantic arm, doesn't he? 
It looks like it might be, even be robotic, but it's not. Uh, so his right arm is 18 inches around. It's about that big around. But look at his left arm. It's like mine. Like he's got the body of a JV girls basketball player, right? except on the right hand side, his right arm is huge. So he was born with a disability, with a genetic problem called KTS. And when you're born with KTS, one of your four limbs, either your arms or your legs, will be gigantic, will be three times as big as the rest of the parts of your body. So he has this huge right arm and this tiny left arm. The rest of his body is tiny. He's got this giant right arm. So what makes him weird makes him wonderful, though. Does anybody know what Matthias Schlitt might do with that giant right arm that he was born with? Go ahead. Throw a football? That's not a bad idea. Go ahead. Arm wrestling. So he found a job, just like Matt Stutz, but he found a job where they reward him for having a giant right arm. Or arm wrestling is where you sit down with somebody and you grab their arm and you go like this. His arm is massive because of something that was wrong with him, but he found a place where they reward him for having a giant right arm and where he actually even tries to make it bigger by constantly exercising it. He's learned that what makes him weird makes him wonderful, and he found a situation that rewards him, right? And this is for the parents and for the kids. So one of the things to think about is, what are those classes where I do really well? What are those activities outside of school that I do really well? What are those situations where I seem to do my best, and how can I do more of those kinds of things instead of trying to spend time in areas where I don't do well? What makes us weird also makes us wonderful. What makes us weak also makes us strong. This guy's name is Travis Price, and he was at school one day, and there was a kid at school in ninth grade, so he was about 13 years old. And he wore a pink shirt to school. This other kid, I would call him Tom, he wore, he wore a pink shirt to school. And some older boys told him that boys shouldn't wear pink. And they told him if he ever wore the pink shirt to school again, they would beat him up and even kill him. It's pretty extreme. So Travis and his friends found out about what happened to this kid. And they went to a store and they bought 50 pink tank top shirts. They brought them in a big plastic bag the next day to school. And they started handing them out to all of the older boys. So the next day when this kid who'd been bullied the day before and told him he was going to get killed if he ever wore his pink golf shirt again, he came into school and he saw 50 older boys wearing pink tank tops. Do you think that made him feel pretty good? Yeah. Do you think that made him feel accepted and that weird wasn't bad? And so what Travis and his friends did is they started something and it started in Canada called Pink Shirt Day. And it's a day to remind people that weird is wonderful and that weakness is strength and that we shouldn't bully people for being unusual. We shouldn't put them down. We shouldn't criticize them. We shouldn't make fun of them. We should accept them and we should support them and we should stand up for people who don't have the strength to stand up for themselves. So this is my lesson for you today. The next time you're tempted to pick on someone who's different, remember that what makes us weird also makes us wonderful and what makes us weak also makes us strong. But the next time you're tempted to hide what's different about you, to think, I don't want to do that, I really like this, but that's not cool with the other kids. I'd really like to wear this, but that's not cool with the other kids. I really like to do these things, but that doesn't seem cool with the other kids. Next time you're tempted to hide what's different about you, remember that what makes us weird also makes us wonderful, and what makes us weak also makes us strong. Thank you very much. <laughs>
So we'll start with looking at different beliefs, which we've already started on, and seeing that the, some of the things we've learned about weaknesses are wrong. And then um, I sent out the assessment to everybody, talking about the importance of assessing yourselves, um, assessing your kids. But then this is the real key step that we normally don't do, which is accepting. That this is the way these kids are, this is the way I am, this is the way my spouse is. Uh, they will talk a little bit about that instead of trying to fight it and trying to change it. And then appreciating it. Not just accepting that your child or your spouse is that way, but appreciating the fact that they are that way. And if we changed our beliefs, then we change our behaviors. If we saw our kids differently, we'd behave differently. And so not only would we not try to reduce those things, we'd amplify those qualities that we've been trying to suppress. Um, we need to find alignment for our kids and for ourselves. We need to find situations that reward us for who we are, like Michael Phelps in the pool. When he's in the pool, people see him as a champion. When he was in school, he was seen as having a disability. We need to avoid activities that don't fit with who we are and give our children sometimes the opportunity to avoid activities that don't fit with who they are. And then affiliate, we need to partner with people who are strong or who are weak. And this is really a big one for families, but also especially for spouses. Um, because really with our spouse, we have the chance to partner with somebody who probably has some strengths where we have weaknesses, um, and has some weaknesses where we have strengths. The problem is instead of appreciating the upside of both of those things, we usually spend our marriages nagging at the downsides of those things and seeing the problems with the other person. So that's the kind of the model that we'll start with thinking differently. Um, and the first part of thinking differently is seeing that everything we've learned about weakness is wrong. So not only was I in trouble with the teachers, the teachers would get frustrated with me. They'd send me to the principal. I was in third grade, so I was eight years old. The principal sat me down in his lap, which seems questionable now looking back on it. Um, and he told me a story about three kinds of bad people. And I'm like, wow, this story doesn't even have good people in it. Right? And he said, there's bad people, really bad people, people who are too far gone. He told me I was a really bad kid on the verge of being too far gone if I couldn't learn to sit still, be quiet, and do what I was told. Now let's talk about intentions for a second. Because he was trying to help me. He was teaching me what his parents and his teachers and his employers had taught him. He had the right intentions. He just had the wrong framework. And that's what I'm trying to show you today. It's not, I don't question anybody's intentions. My parents had the right intentions. They just had the wrong framework. They thought that success for them is getting me to sit still, be quiet, and do what I was told. But it turned out that success was actually becoming a professional speaker. They loved me. They had the right intentions, but they had the wrong Framework. And the framework that we've all been taught, basically, by our parents, our teachers, and our employers, at least the majority of people, is that you have to find weaknesses and fix them in order to succeed. You have to overcome the problems in order to succeed, and I want to give you a different um, idea today. And so I wasn't the only one who had trouble at school. Ken Robinson says many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think they're not, because the thing they were good at at school wasn't valued or was actually stigmatized. Now let's not pick on school, right? Many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think they're not because the thing they were good at at home wasn't valued or was actually stigmatized. Like I said, my parents called me motor mouth, trying to get me, trying to shame me into being quiet. But it's not just school and home. Many highly talented, brilliant, creative people think they're not because the thing they were good at at work wasn't valued or was actually stigmatized. Some of you probably started your own business precisely because your unique skills weren't valued at work and they might even have been seen as problems or something that you needed to overcome. But look at this process. The thing they were good at, their strength, wasn't valued, it was ignored or denied, or it was actually stigmatized. We told people that the best thing about them was the worst thing about them. And as we've already talked about, I realized that's exactly what happened to me because I'm a professional speaker now. I get paid to stand up and talk and run my own business. Nobody needs me to sit still, be quiet, and do what I was told. And I know that you understand this about EO. EO is about experience share, so I'm not here giving you advice today. This is my experience, and when I had the experience of realizing that my weaknesses were strengths, I started to wonder if that might be true for other people. I started exploring this idea. I came up with the assessment that we sent to you. I wrote a book about it, and I found amazing stories and ideas and examples of people whose weaknesses were also strengths as well. So the next step we go to is awareness. We need to understand their strengths and weaknesses. That's why we sent out the assessment. Uh, but specifically, I want you to see that weaknesses and strengths are connected. And so one of the reasons we don't have a great level of awareness sometimes of our kids' strengths and weaknesses, our employees' strengths and weaknesses, our own strengths and weaknesses, our spouses' strengths and weaknesses, is because of something psychologists call negativity bias. Negativity bias says we tend to see what's wrong instead of what's right in any situation. Even if what's wrong is really, really small and what's right is really, really big. 
So imagine at lunch I spilled some of that yellow barbecue sauce all over the front of my shirt. Just a big baseball sized stain. It's still a little sticky. It's got a little bit of brisket in it, right? <laughs> What negativity bias says is if that was the case, every single person in this room would be staring at that stain and thinking negative things about me as a human being because I can't keep myself clean. Some of you, and you know who you are, wouldn't be able to pay attention at all. It'd be like the stain was talking to you the whole time. <laughs> and no matter how positive and encouraging you think you are, it also says there's not a single person in this room who'd be looking at that stain and thinking to themselves, that Dave Rendell is doing a good job. Because 98% of that shirt is stain free. Nice job, man. Nice job. Now, some of you are thinking, and it's fair, you're thinking, no, that's subjectivity, that's marketing, that's spin control, that's not the story, but it's not. It's a measurable, objective, scientific reality. We can lay out the shirt, we can measure the surface area of the stain in the shirt and see that 98% is stain free. But if you were asked to evaluate my appearance at the end of this presentation, most people would not only give me a failing score, they'd give me a zero because you shouldn't have stains on your clothes. But if your kid goes to school and they get a 98% on everything they do, what's their grade point average going to be? Where are they going to graduate in relation to the rest of their class? They're, going to do, they're doing very, very well. And meanwhile, I'm getting a zero because we shouldn't have stains on our clothes. Now, that's an abstract example, although most of you, I think, understood it. But let me bring it closer to home. And I do this all the time, not just when I'm talking to parents. Um, if your kid brings home a report card that's all A's and one C, what are you going to talk about that night? Talk about the C. That's what we do. We're not going to probably sign them up for extra programs in the classes where they're getting A's. We're going to sign them up for tutoring and support, ask them more questions about those classes where they're getting the C's. We're going to focus in and we're think we're seeing the whole picture when in fact we're zoomed in on the weakness, we're missing the strengths around the edges. We do this with each other as married partners. We do this with our kids. We do this with our employees. We zoom in on the weaknesses and we miss the strengths. And not only that, but we think we're, he we're seeing the whole story. We think we're understanding the whole picture about the person. Now that's okay because Parker Palmer says we're led to truth by our weaknesses as well as our strengths. And what I'm trying to show you today is that every weakness has a corresponding strength. And if that's true, we can use our natural ability to see what's wrong with people to lead us to what's right about them. So that seems ridiculous that weaknesses are strengths and that we can find people's strengths by seeing their weaknesses. So let's practice and we'll practice with a kid example. So I'm going to tell you a story about my youngest daughter, Sophia. This isn't one of those braggy parent stories. Uh, I'm not trying to convince you my kids better than your kids. I'm, I'm going to show you that my daughter is way worse than your kids. Okay. So I'm going to tell you a story that's exclusively about my daughter's weaknesses. I'm not going to tell you anything good about her. What I want you to listen for is the strength. So as you listen to me tell you about the weaknesses, I want you to see if you can imagine there's any strengths that are connected to these weaknesses. So we'll start with uh, the beginning. Sophia's our youngest. Um, she's our third uh, out of three, and she's difficult. How many of you have at least one kid who's difficult? How many of you have a kid who is so difficult, if you would have had them first, you wouldn't have had more? Right? That's a different level, right? So Sophia's our third, and we only have three because we're like, we're not good at this anymore. We need to stop because we, we ran out of the ingredients. I don't know what we need to not do that we're not producing them at the same level that we used to be producing them. And so she's difficult. One example of her being difficult is she looked us in the eye one time when she was four years old, straight up, looked at both my wife and I, she said, I hate you, and I wish I had another family. That's a tough performance evaluation, right? That's a tough annual evaluation from the kids, right? We're like, wow, you know, I guess, I guess we appreciate you sharing your feelings with us. I guess it's good that you felt comfortable saying that, and we've created that level of transparency um, because we've been feeling the same way about you. We didn't know we, didn't know we could create this level of openness. You know, we didn't know we could say that out loud. Uh, we're, we were gonna, we, we've been looking for options for you. We didn't know you were open to a train. We're going to see what we can do before the train deadline. You know, and see if we can't get you out there. Uh, so, so, she's difficult. One of the things that makes her difficult is she's a liar. Right? She's a liar. Uh, now, now, we all lie, so what makes someone a liar? Okay, so I'll give you an example. So my wife, let's say my wife makes the pan of brownies. There's one left. 
I want a brownie, and I'm selfish, and I just eat it, and there's no brownies left. If my wife comes to me and says, hey, Dave, did you eat the last brownie, what am I going to say? No, I did not eat the last brownie. I do not understand how lying works. I do not understand. If you went to Alan and he ate the last brownie, you'd be like, no, I didn't eat the last brownie. But that's the way you do it. You go scot free. No one's going to catch you. There's not cameras, right? This is fine. This is how long term relationships work. You don't tell each other the truth. Here's how my daughter's different. She's a liar. She doesn't just tell lies. She's a liar. So here's how this works. Remember, who ate the brownie? I ate the brownie. But my wife is still in the search of who ate the brownie because I lied. So she goes to Sophia. Sophia, did you eat the brownie? What's Sophia going to say? Yeah. She'll go, yeah, I ate the brownie. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> that's not how lying works. That's not, she doesn't understand the principle of dishonesty. <laughs> so she's just indeterminately dishonest. Does that make sense? She doesn't use it strategically the way the rest of us do. She uses it just as the general practice. <laughs> So, Sophia went to school, first day of school, the teacher's instructions were bring a snack and a lunch. So she packed a bottle of water and some Ritz crackers in a Ziploc bag, took them to school. Snack time rolls around, everybody gets out their snack. But some kids didn't have a snack. Sophia's like, hey, what's up with that? Those kids don't have a snack. And when she saw they didn't have a snack, she saw the teacher go and get some cookies and some juice and give it to the kids who didn't have a snack. And she's like, this is some bull crap right here. <laughs> she's like, I'm over here with crackers and water, basically prison rations. <laughs> These delinquent kids that didn't follow instructions or get cookies and juice, I want cookies and juice. So she raised her hand. First day of kindergarten, raised her hand. The teacher calls her and she says, Sophia, what can I do for you? She goes, I forgot to tell you earlier today, I'm actually allergic to water. <laughs> all her credibility on day one of school for some cookies and juice, and it's the K-12 private school. Every teacher knew the story on the first day. That's how it got back to us, because her grandma teaches in the high school. Every teacher knows my daughter's a liar first day of kindergarten. Be on the lookout for her. She's a little liar. So Sophia's difficult. Sophia's a liar. What are the strengths that you might have heard when I was telling you those stories? What are the strengths? Creative. Okay, what else? Confident. That's exactly. It. I would say she has unearned confidence, right? She has unearned confidence. Like she'll tell me some stupid riddles that like five-year-olds share with each other, and I'll get them right, and she'll be like, "Oh, how did you do that?" <laughs> she just has no sense that anybody else isn't smarter than her, right? If it was tough for her, it might be tough for you, right? She can do anything better than you. So she's got unearned confidence. Uh, she's creative. Anything else? Direct. She's direct, right? She's straight up. She's not hiding her feelings. She's not going to be a diplomat of any kind. Okay, what else? She's what? Very perceptive. She's very, what do you mean? Tell me that one. Where did you hear that? Well, I was just thinking she just gave the children giving these things. She wanted that, so she... And she doesn't have allergies <laughs> of any kind. And neither does anybody at her house. So she didn't know what allergies were until the first day of school. And she learned that morning... That if you're allergic to something, you cannot be forced to consume that thing if you must be given a substitute. So she perceived that, right, and then saw this happening and was like, hey, here's my chance. Okay? So, now this is what's interesting. I only gave you negative inputs, and four people quickly told me things that are not only positives, but are absolutely true about my daughter. In fact, probably her defining characteristics. When you look for it, you can see a strength connected to any weakness. Now, I gave you an assessment that will keep you from having to look too hard, but you see how this works, and you were able to do it. But we normally don't. If something's wrong with your kid, you don't normally look for the strength. You look for more what? Weakness, right? We are like, oh, like we got a bad one the third time. Like, it didn't work out. Like, what, what, what else is wrong with that person? And think about it. Um, how many, raise your hand if you have more than one kid. How many of us can agree that we love the oldest one the most? Do we agree on that? <laughs> now you laugh nervously because... But I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to prove it to you with one word. With one word. Pacifiers. Pacifiers. Here's what I mean. When you have the first kid, and you give him a pacifier, if you even give him a pacifier, because you're like, I don't know. I don't know if we're going to give him pacifiers. Maybe it'll screw up their teeth. With the second one, you're like, whatever works to get them to shut the hell up, we will put anything in their mouth. 
alcohol, whatever it takes, <laughs> Benadryl, give me things. So with the first one, though, you give them a pacifier. When it falls on the ground with the first one, what do you do? It gets boiled. It gets put in a sealed Ziploc bag. You have gloves. You've got tongs. You've got a backup stack of them that have been pre-sanitized. Second one, you put it in their mouth. It falls on the floor. It's going to get rinsed, but it's not going to get sanitized, boiled, sealed. Third one falls out of their mouth at an interstate truck stop bathroom. <laughs> it's going right back in. That's homeopathic medicine. It's like a vaccine. It makes them stronger by giving them a little bit of the bad stuff. It helps them fight back, right? It helps them fight back. <laughs> but think about your first one. That was just meant to be funny. Think about your first one when you took them to the doctor, the pediatrician, the first time when they were really little, and you took them back the second time and the third time and the fourth time. Think back, what was the question you asked that pediatrician the most? It was some version of this. My child does this, is that normal? And as soon as they say yes, your, your anxiety level went from here to here. We, and that's what I'm trying to show you, we believe, I say what makes us weird makes us wonderful, and I give you examples and you can nod your head, but what we've all been taught and what we all believe to some extent is normal is good, and different is bad. We took our kindergartner, Sophia, to the, she had to get a checkup for, for the physical you have to get for school. When she was five, they did testing on her, you know, height, weight, all that stuff. Her body mass index calculated out to zero. She does not exist as a human being in physical form. So what did they tell us? Did they say, well, some kids are different sizes and different shapes, don't worry about it. They said, no, you need to feed her more. You're bad parents. In fact, we need to talk to you a little bit. As though we were malnourishing her, she was 98th percentile for height. You're not 98th percentile for height if you're malnourished. She was just skinny, just like people noticed I was, and she hasn't developed the tummy yet, so she's just all skinny. And so they said something's wrong, even though something isn't wrong. Just because someone isn't in the middle of the curve doesn't mean anything's wrong with them. She's just different. Right? She's just different. So what makes us weird makes us wonderful, and I really want to show you that's true, and we live in a society that's taught us the whole time, and sometimes, since we're trying to help our kids succeed in society, succeed at school so they can succeed at work, so they can succeed in life, sometimes even if we believe and we're willing to maybe accept the weirdness, we're worried the world won't, and so sometimes we're trying to normalize them to prepare them for the outside world. Does that make sense? And you might think you're doing your child a disservice by celebrating some of these things that we're talking about, but you're not because the world celebrates it as well. We just don't see it very clearly, and everybody blames it on somebody else. Well, I'm just trying to get them ready for school. And school says, well, we're just trying to prepare them for work. And work just says, we're just trying to deal with the competition. And the reality is, in all those situations, people are succeeding without doing the things the school says, the employer says, etc. And that's part of the reason you're here, is because you went outside of that world. And that's one danger, and I don't, I don't want you to think I'm being critical, but I want to tell you one thing I've noticed because I've been doing EO stuff for, for like seven years. Some of you succeeded by going outside of the traditional system of go to a good school, go to a good college, get a good job. That's why you're here. You succeeded outside of that system. Some of you did the exact opposite. You did poorly in school, didn't go to college, didn't get a job, started a business, and had phenomenal success. But then, without realizing it, and again, I'm not saying you have the wrong intentions, without noticing it, your goal for your child is now for them to do what? Go to a good school, get into a college, get a good job, get a nice house. What the hell? That's not fair. And you're afraid when they start demonstrating some of the same characteristics you demonstrated when you were in school, when they start struggling with some of the same things you struggled with, you're upset because you've redefined success as the version of success that you didn't have. Does that make sense? We let the world suck us into their definition of success when that wasn't even the way you succeeded. Right. And so we need to make sure that we don't let that normal definition of success invade our lives. One of the reasons my middle daughter goes to <laughs> online uh, school right now, uh, she's in 10th grade, and she does school online, is because when she asked for an alternative version of schooling, I felt like it was only consistent for me to do that because I have an alternative way of living my life, right? If I'm living an unconventional life and I have an unconventional career, why can't my daughter have an unconventional school experience? If I'm adapting my life to who I am and trying to find the rest of the best fit for who I am, if I found an alternative path to success, why can't I let my kids find an alternative path to success? Does that make sense? So that's my challenge to you today. Be careful that you don't let the society's definition of good suck you into 
seeing your child as somehow less than or struggling or you have, feel like you have your child has to have different goals than the ones you have. If you succeed in using an unconventional path, the question with your kids is what path could they potentially take to success? And how can you make sure that other people don't define success for you? So the next part is acceptance that weaknesses are strengths in disguise. Uh, so I want to introduce you to two people. Uh, the first one is Adventurous Al. Adventurous Al loves to go on trips. He's always traveling. Uh, when, he, when he's on trips, he loves to climb up things and jump out of things. He's always on the move. He doesn't have a steady job. He only works long enough to make enough money for his next trip. He doesn't have a home. He doesn't have a car. He doesn't uh, rent a car. He's just always on the move. And on one of his trips, he meets a beautiful woman, and her name is Librarian Lucy. <laughs> Librarian Lucy is steady. She's reliable. She's dependable. She has a job. She has a career plan. She has money in her 401k. She owns a home. She's paid off her car. She's kicking butt and taking names. So Al and Lucy meet. They fall in love. It's a love story. So my question to you is, why does someone like Adventurous Al fall in love with someone like Librarian Lucy? Why does someone like Librarian Lucy fall in love with someone like Adventurous Al? Excitement, okay. What else? Opposites attract. So let's go one step farther. What's attractive about the opposite? Part of it's excitement, right? Something different. But what's attractive about the opposite? It's what you're not. It's what you're not. Somebody has something you don't have. That's not the whole thing, right? Because if trailer has Ebola and I don't have Ebola, <laughs> I don't want the Ebola. <laughs> so opposites attract. If someone has something I don't have that I wish I did have. And probably that I don't wish I did have that I've been told I should have. Al's been told his whole life to grow up and settle down. Lucy's been told her whole life to loosen up and have some fun. And they see in the other person everything they're not, but they believe they at least should be. And then over time, they've come to want to be. Because George Eliot said, we begin to believe what the world believes about us. And if people have told you your whole life you should be something else, you start to think you want to be that thing. So they meet, they fall in love. It's a love story. They get married. We check in with them five years later. How's it probably going? Not good. They're divorced with restraining orders in place. <laughs> and the question is why? And here's the answer. Because the very characteristics they hoped would rub off on them have started to rub them the wrong way. The very characteristics that attracted them have started to repel them, except they don't see that it's the very characteristics they think it's something else. They think, what happened to this good person that I initially connected with? They don't see that they're starting to see weaknesses where they used to see strengths. So let's break this process down, and I'll show this to you very, very simply. So Lucy married Al because he's easygoing, adventurous, and spontaneous. That sounds good. But after a while, easygoing starts to feel irresponsible, and adventurous starts to feel dangerous, and spontaneous starts to feel impulsive. Now you might say, well, these aren't the same thing, but they absolutely are the same thing. Let's take spontaneous and impulsive. You can look it up on your phone right now. If you're a nerd like me, you've got the Merriam-Webster app. You can look it up, and spontaneous means to do things without planning or forethought. What does impulsive mean? To do things without planning or forethought. So why is it good to be spontaneous and bad to be impulsive? Well, it's not. It's that some things we see as spontaneous and other things we see as impulsive. Let me give you an example. Let's say I'm at work and I'm driving home and I see somebody selling flowers on the side of the road, and so I just pull over, I grab a couple flowers, I take them home to my wife. It's not uh, her birthday. It's not our anniversary. I haven't done anything wrong that I'm currently aware of. <laughs> I just got her some flowers. How's that probably going to be perceived? It's probably going to be perceived as spontaneous. Maybe a little selfie with the flowers, not with me, but a little selfie with the flowers, right? My spontaneous man did for me a little Facebook post, right? <laughs> the next day I come home with a new Harley Davidson motorcycle. How's that probably going to be perceived, right? <laughs> Now she's got an impulsive man on her hands. The next day I come home with a new girlfriend, she's going to get all judgy about it. <laughs> Here's the point. In none of those situations, which were hypothetical, by the way, was I thinking about the consequences of my behavior, but one was a good one, two were bad ones. Here's the point. Acceptance is that when you're with a spontaneous person, you are also with a what? Impulsive. Impulsive person. And if you like that, you don't get to be with a spontaneous person because spontaneity is impulsivity. It's the same thing, just with two different labels. Now let's look at Lucy so you see this again. So she's structured, responsible, and cautious. That sounds good. 
But after a while, structured starts to feel inflexible, responsible starts to feel controlling, and cautious starts to feel fearful. Now, I know a little bit about this, because I've been married for 24 years to a woman who is structured and inflexible. <laughs> so I do iron hands like I talked about, an ultra marathon, so I always have a bottle of water with me. You're always trying to stay hydrated, travel a lot, you're on the airplanes, got to stay hydrated. So I always have water with me. Mm. Delicious and refreshing. But I have other things to do in my life than to hold on to my water. And so when I'm at my house, sometimes I'll set it down. And that's my first mistake. <laughs> because I've lost physical contact with my beverage. <laughs> and then I'll start working on something, sending some emails while she's to Netflix. And that's my second mistake, because I've lost visual contact with my beverage. I can't protect it anymore. <laughs> and when I realize I'm thirsty again, and I go back to get my drink, can anybody tell me where it is? It's gone. If it's a bottle, it's in the recycles. If it's a cup, it's in the dishwasher. And when I ask my wife where it is, does she calmly explain to me what happened? No, she loses her damn mind, right? She's like, I don't know where it is. There's bottles and cans and cups and mugs all over this house. I've been sitting out for two or three weeks. Have things growing inside of them. Nobody helps around here except me. Maybe I didn't throw away your water, but if I did, I guess you could just go ahead and get another one, couldn't you? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Settle down, right? By the way, quick relationship management tip. When your spouse is upset, if you'll just tell them to settle down, just use the hands. Just use the hands. <laughs> Laughter is the right response. If you're like writing a note on that one, all of your relationships are about to end. You're like, Dave said, just use the hands. <laughs> the only way to stay hydrated in my house is to have the camelback backpack. <laughs> So why are my wife and I still married after 24 years? It's because of acceptance, not compromise. Acceptance, and here's what acceptance means. Accepting the reality that structure is inflexibility. Does that make sense? Structure is inflexibility. Not on a personal level, on a physical level. You can't have one without the other. What I realize is that I can't trade my life in for someone who's just structured but not inflexible, right? If I told Marla, you know, I don't like this room, I'd like a little more space out to the side, she can't move this wall because it's structured, therefore it's inflexible. But you've all been in conference rooms at hotels where they have those foldable, movable walls, and they're more flexible because they're less structured and they're not holding up the building because they have less structure, they have more flexibility. It's not a criticism of you if you're a structured person that you're also inflexible. My wife's a lovely person. She just wishes the rest of us didn't live at the house with her. <laughs> She's always got these Buddhist sayings like everything has a place and everything in its place. But if everything has a place, and you put it in a different place, you put it in the wrong place. That's a lack of flexibility. It's not like, well, that was a good place, and they nailed it. And that's not the way it works. Do you live with us? Don't. So, so many funny things happen after my talks. We don't have time to talk all of them, about all of them, but I'll be signing books, which I'm happy to do for you. And if you haven't got the book, we have extra ones out there. And we also have at least one kid's book for, we think, almost every family. Um, and so I'll sign them for your kids. Um, but uh, people will come up to me at the book table, and some guy will go, I'm your wife. And I'm like, whoa, whoa. I don't know where this is going, but I'm uncomfortable. But what he means is he's the water destroyer at his house, right? Or some woman will say, I'm your wife. Or some dude will say, I'm married to your wife, and I'm like, I don't know what's happening right now, but I'm uncomfortable. Uh, but that's, okay, so, and we're talking about acceptance, so this is why I do the speeches the way I do them. None of you were confused about exam that example, we're like, I don't get it. I'm talking about human nature, and I'm talking about human experience. The problem is we normally don't see the connection, though, and we just go, why can't that person just calm down? Why can't that person just take it easy? Why does it have to matter? Why do things have to be in the right place? And at the same time, we were probably attracted to that person at the beginning because of this characteristic, but now we've chosen, and this is the key, we've chosen. We didn't think we did, but you can decide if you're going to appreciate the structure the other person brings, or if you're going to be frustrated by the inflexibility. You can decide if you're going to be happy that they're responsible or be frustrated that they want to be in charge of things and take things over. My middle, my oldest daughter is like this. She's responsible, but even as a child, she's controlling. If she's not 15 minutes early to school, she's late. 
Right? When she drives now, which is great, she gets there like four hours early. Uh, but when we would drive her, if we get her there 14 minutes early, she'd be like, this is bull crap. I don't know what kind of operation you're running here. You can't be on time. Like, I'll go to, I'll go to field trips with her. When she was like in fourth grade, she'd be like, Dad, you can't behave like that. You're going to get me in trouble. The teacher doesn't like it. Let's get it together. You know? She's always been more responsible, but she's like, I will not accept that behavior. You need to get it together. She's wonderful and she's awful. Right? And you married somebody maybe because they were cautious and you wished you were more cautious and people have always told you you're a little bit out of control, but then you're like, hey, why is that person so afraid? Well, if you weren't afraid, you wouldn't be. And there's a decent level of this that makes, makes sense, right? That's why I don't jump out of airplanes, because I'm scared, right? Like false evidence appearing real. No, you can die and you can hurt yourself. So every characteristic is a strength and a weakness. So I'll give you one more example. Uh, I'm tall. We've talked about that. The kids notice that. It's good to be tall. We pay tall people more than we pay smaller people for the same work. And it's because we have a bias towards height. We think tall people are smarter than they are. Scientists do studies and they have people guess how smart people are. And as people get taller, male or female, it doesn't matter. And as people get taller, we think they're smarter. If you look at all the presidential elections since the beginning of America, the vast majority of the time the election is won by the taller candidate, and it happens at the local and state level as well. When we can see people and compare their heights, uh, we get interested in how tall they are and it affects our decision. It's not a guarantee. You're not like, oh, my team's going to win next time. We're going to get the tall one. Uh, but it's the vast majority of the time. So it's good to be tall until it's not good to be tall. Uh, I got home at 2 in the morning on Thursday from San Diego just to fly to Nashville at 5 o'clock on Friday night. I live on airplanes, and, and Nashville isn't a hub, I don't think, for any major airline, and Raleigh is definitely not a hub for any major airline. And so every time I leave Raleigh, North Carolina, I'm leaving on a regional jet. If you don't know what a regional jet is, this is a Fisher-Price airplane. It's not a real airplane. <laughs> So every time I go to get on the flight, the flight attendant sees me coming. She always says the same thing, sir, you need to watch your head, which is hard to do. And I get on the airplane like this. And some of you are like, whatever, Dave, we've ducked before. You have, but you're used to re-emerging on the other side. I don't get to re-emerge. I just shuffle like a hobbit to my seat. But I fly a lot, so I get that exit row seat. I get that economy comfort on the way here. I got that first class upgrade. I'm OK once I sit down. But sooner or later, I have to go to the bathroom. And if you don't fit in the middle of the plane, you certainly don't fit on the side of the plane where they jam these bathrooms. And some people have accused me of exaggerating this next part, which is why I've taken the liberty of an airplane bathroom selfie. <laughs> so this is me in an actual airplane bathroom. If you're trying to orient, this is the ceiling of the airplane bathroom. This is my shoulder on the ceiling of the airplane bathroom. It's not even the top of my shoulder. It's the side of my shoulder on the ceiling of the airplane bathroom. So I get in the airplane bathroom. I close the door behind me. I try to latch it, but I can't be sure because I can't turn around to check it. And now I'm here, but the toilet's over there, and I have things that need to go in the toilet. So I try to move closer, it's the obvious move. But the ceiling goes like this. So as I try to move closer, it just pushes my face closer, closer, closer. The toilet is now what I'm looking for. So I've designed something I like to call the limbo yoga approach. What I do is I press my face into the ceiling, and then I try to form my upper body to the shape of the side of the airplane, just press it in there, which allows me to move the lower body and rotate. Now the problem is there's not a lot of visual information. So I thought maybe I could look at that little mirror they have on the sink and maybe I could do some targeting. And as I was looking at that mirror, I realized, wait a second, there is a sink right there. That is a whole lot higher and a whole lot closer. That seems custom designed for what needs to happen here. That's the tall man's urinal is what that is. That's fantastic. Now, some of you didn't even realize you were so disgusted by that story, you spontaneously and unconsciously started rubbing hand sanitizer just all over yourself like, while I was doing that. And if you felt that way, you misunderstood me. The same way a guy misunderstood me in Charleston, South Carolina a few years ago. He came up to me after the talk and he goes, I know what you mean, Dave. He goes, I'm a big guy. He goes, I don't even try for the toilet anymore in those airplane bathrooms. He goes, I just whip it out, go right in the sink every time. I was like, oh, that's because you're disgusting. I said, you got confused, that was a true story. And I turned it into a funny story. I don't go in the sink. I'm not an animal. I go all over the wall like a normal person. It's classic. And here's the 
moral of that story. We already talked about it. It was good to be told, but it's also bad to be told. And we don't do well with that. People want to come up to me, and they, even after this, they want to say, no, 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 Dave, is it good or is it bad to be told? And the answer is yes. It is good and it is bad to be told. It's both. And we have a hard time with understanding. There's advantages and disadvantages. There's strengths and weaknesses. And what I want to show you today, and that's what the assessment is for, is every characteristic is like that. Every single characteristic is a strength and a weakness at the same time. I've had shorter people who started to figure this out, and it wasn't the point of that story. I've had smaller people come up to me after the talk and say, I never knew there was any advantages to being small, but I don't care about what seat I get. I never hit my head, and I can do yoga in the airplane bathroom. I didn't know that that was an advantage, and I didn't know that there was any downside to being tall. I just always thought my life would be exclusively better if I was taller, and that's not true. Does that make sense? There's advantages and disadvantages to every characteristic. And a good way to think about this is like side effects. There's no such thing as medicine without side effects. And what I want to show you today is no such thing as kids without side effects, employees without side effects, spouses and partners without side effects. Everybody has side effects. And just like we accept that we can't have the benefit of the medicine without getting the side effect, we have to accept that people have side effects. Peter Drucker said it this way. He said, strong people always have strong weaknesses, too, where there are peaks, there are valleys. Strong people always have strong weaknesses, too, where there are peaks, there are valleys. If you want strong kids, if you want a strong spouse, if you want strong employees, if you want strong partners, they're always going to have strong weaknesses, too, where there are peaks, there are valleys. And the problem is we live in a world that gets so obsessed with fixing the weaknesses, filling in the valleys, that we actually take the material from the peaks and we tear it down to fill in the valleys. And we make our kids worse, we make our employees worse, we make ourselves worse, we make our spouses and our partners worse in our attempt to seemingly make them better. Now, acceptance isn't a word. Some of you aren't where you are because of acceptance, and so you're still struggling with this. And so let me give you an example of what happens when you don't accept. So let's look at Walmart. What's Walmart's biggest strength? Price. They're cheap, low prices. That's their, really their only strength. Does Walmart have any weaknesses? We have other things to do today, and so we're going to summarize. Now, poor service, poor quality, poor design. So let's go to Target. Ladies, what do we call Target? Target. Target, right? A self-respecting woman will tell you I got it at Target. No woman in the history of humankind has ever gone up to another woman and said, I got it at Walmart. Check it out. <laughs> So we call it Target because it's better service, better quality, better design. So then why doesn't everybody shop there? It's because the prices are a little bit higher. You have to pay more to have that experience. So let's go back to Walmart. Let's fix them. Let's just fix service. Let's hire more people, train them better, treat them better, pay them better, give them better benefits. What just happened to the costs at Walmart? They went, what just happened to the prices at Walmart? They went, what just happened to the only strength they have? It went down. You thought you were fixing them, but you were making them worse. You fixed the weakness, but once you accept that it's connected to a strength, you can't touch it without damaging that corresponding strength. Same thing at Target. If we're going to lower those prices, we're going to have to sacrifice service, quality, and design, and stop being Target and go back to being Target. But what some of you are thinking is because we, what we've been taught is no, you got to be the best of both worlds. You've got to be well-balanced and well-rounded. You've got to be the perfect middle ground. There's a company that, called that, that tried that, and it's called Kmart. They were the low price leader. They had the distribution, the location, the reputation. They were the savings place, the blue light special. And when Walmart came to town, all they had to do were lower their prices a little bit for a little while and Walmart would have gone out of business. But instead they hired Martha Stewart. They tried to be a little bit of Target and a little bit of Walmart and they ended up bankrupt. They ended up the worst of both worlds. They ended up mediocre and invisible. And then they came out of bankruptcy and what did they do? They kept the same strategy and then bought Sears. And now Sears and Kmart together are going bankrupt again. And the reason I'm so passionate about this talk is that I'm worried we're turning our kids into Kmarts. And that sometimes we're turning ourselves and our spouses into Kmarts. And then we're turning our employees into Kmarts. Because we live in a world where our parents, our teachers, and our employers teach us that we need to fix weaknesses in order to succeed. And we need to find what's wrong and fix it in order to be better. And we legitimately believe that's true and we have the right intentions. But it's the wrong framework and we end up making things worse when the goal is to make things better. And as we try to fix those weaknesses, we end up damaging the corresponding strength. I love this from Uncommon Service. It says, striving for all around excellence leads directly to mediocrity. But the problem is when your kid gets all A's and an F, they got to keep doing that class until they get an A. They don't get to go to the next thing. You have to be good at everything in school, at least good enough, 
or you don't get to keep moving, but in real life, you can be bad at most things and kind of just be good at one thing, and you can be fine. I'm good at one thing, talking, right? And I'm bad at a lot of things. We don't have time for all the things. Right? Striving for all-around excellence leads directly to mediocrity. So what makes us weird also makes us wonderful. What makes us weak also makes us strong. We need to accept that, but we also need to appreciate it. To see that we succeed because of our weaknesses, not in spite of them. Now, we already talked about that. We talked about those people with dyslexia who were billionaires. My friend is a principal at a school, a middle school, and that's the grade where, that's the time of uh, the kid's school life where they tend to be diagnosed with dyslexia. And when parents found out their kids had dyslexia and he gave them the diagnosis, he would share those stats I gave you about the billionaires with dyslexia and what happened to their perspective about their kid. They went from feeling like it was a death sentence for their kid's future to going, ooh, I wonder what my child will get me when they become a billionaire. And think about how that changes the way you probably treat that child. Think about how it changes the way I treat Sophia, and I see her weakness is also a strength. She's a liar, but she's creative, as one of you said, and creative is imaginative thinking. Creative thinking is imagination, and she's by far the most imaginative kid that we have. <laughs> She doesn't ride the skateboard. She grabs the skateboard. She gets her boogie board. She puts her boogie board on top of the skateboard. Then she puts on gardening gloves. Then she kneels down on the skateboard and goes down the street like this. <laughs> she doesn't do anything in the normal way. She's tremendously creative, but sometimes she tries to sell her imagination as reality, and we call that dishonesty. But do you think it changes my relationship with her that I can appreciate the upside of who she is and not just see the downside? Does that make sense? So appreciation is crucial. I love this quote from George Eliot. She says, every limit is a beginning as well as an ending. And in a sense, that sums up this presentation. I'm trying to show you the beginnings that come with the limits that we have. Matt Sussman didn't have arms, and he's the best in the world at archery. Michael Phelps is the best in the world at swimming, but they told him he was hyperactive, and his mom could have just simply given him the medicine, helped him succeed at school, and we never would have heard of Michael Phelps. Nobody asks what was his grade point average. They say, wow, what an amazing person. His mom saw the beginning that came with the limits that he had. That's appreciation. And that's why I want you to do that assessment with your kids. When you can see that, yeah, your kid is distractible, but that's because they're curious and they love to explore. And isn't that a positive characteristic that will serve them well in this life? And if you saw your kid as curious and exploring, wouldn't you treat them differently than if you saw them as distractible and unfocused? Does that make sense? If you could see that strength and appreciate that strength, wouldn't it change your relationship with them? And wouldn't you give them different opportunities than if you think you have to remediate these weaknesses that they have? So what makes us weird also makes us wonderful. If we appreciate this, you'll know if you've gotten to appreciation because you'll start to see yourself and others as more wonderful than you did previously. What makes us weak also makes us strong. You'll know you're to appreciation if you start to see people as stronger instead of seeing them as weaker. But now it's time to change our behaviors. If we see our kids differently, awareness, acceptance, and appreciation. If we see our spouse differently, awareness, acceptance, appreciation. We're going to behave differently. We're going to act differently. And the first thing we're going to do is amplification. We're going to exaggerate weaknesses instead of eliminating them. We're going to turn up the volume instead of turning it down. And we're going to allow other people to turn up the volume instead of turning it down. Instead of asking people to be less of who they are, we're going to give people an opportunity to be more of who they are. Now, that sounds stupid. Why would you let your child or your spouse or yourself turn up the volume on an apparently negative characteristic? So let me give you an example. This is Jimmy Kimmel. He's a late night talk show host. He's a comedian. He has his own television show. And recently he was asked to host the White House Correspondents' Dinner. It's a black tie affair, lots of famous and successful people there. And at one point, he leans into the podium and he seems to be getting really serious. And he says, I just want to take a minute to thank Mr. Mills, my 10th grade history teacher, who told me that I would never amount to anything if I didn't stop screwing around. Uh, Mr. Mills, I'm about to high five the President of the United States of America. And then he did, putting this woman in the most awkward picture of all time. <laughs> And then he came back to the podium and he said, eat it, Mills. <laughs> now again, Mr. Mills had the right intentions. He was teaching with his parents and his teachers and his employers and taught him. He said, you'll never amount to anything that's rough. My parents gave me hope. They said, you'll never amount to much, right? <laughs> but he said, you'll never amount to anything unless you stop screwing around. He didn't just tell him to dial it back. He told him to shut it. <clears throat> but how did Jimmy Kimmel succeed? By becoming more childish, more silly, more ridiculous, more immature, he went pro at screwing around. 
Mr. Mills told him that's never going to work for you. You have to stop it all together. And then Jimmy said, what if I went pro? What if I did it full time? Now, some of you might be skeptical and you might loosely know who Jimmy Kimmel is, but you might not know the whole story. So let me just give you one example. If you don't think he's more childish, silly, ridiculous, and immature, here's just one of the things he puts on his show. He, on his show, tells his parents the night before Halloween that on the night of Halloween, when their kids go to bed, to hide all the Halloween candy. And then the next morning when the kids wake up and ask for Halloween candy, not only do you say no, you say no not because I won't let you, but because your mom and I ate it all. <laughs> and then when the kid justifiably freaks out, you're supposed to take out your iPhone and film them freaking out. Then you're supposed to send it to Jimmy Kimmel and then he will embarrass them on national television, making you a horrible person and him a horrible person as well. That's just one of his things. Does that make sense? He's gone pro at something that Mr. Wilson told him is never going to get anywhere. I bought my parents a house with the money that I make as a professional speaker. <clears throat> my parents remember the story differently now, don't they? Right? They're like, we always knew of our four kids. <laughs> Dave was the one. We were always encouraging him. We were always like, you be you, Dave. You be you. <laughs> but here's the important part of that story. Remember what I said about intentions and framework? See, I'm not in therapy about my parents. I don't hate my parents. My parents had the right intentions, but they got the wrong framework from their parents, their teachers, their employers. They were doing their best with the information they have. I wouldn't have bought them a house if I hated my parents. I love my parents because they loved me. They just had the wrong perspective because most of us have been taught the wrong perspective because we live in a world that teaches us this isn't true when I can give you another thousand examples of how it is. We don't succeed by turning the volume down. I gave you the Iron Man example. The same people praised me and rewarded me for the same thing they used to criticize and punish me for, being very, very, very active. Not when I dialed it back, but when I cranked it all the way up. Nobody in this room thinks 16 hours and 15 minutes is just the right amount of activity in a day. It's when I amplified that I found success. It's when I became a professional speaker that I found success. How could you amplify your weaknesses? How can you get your kids the ability to amplify it? Everybody say, I won't want them to amplify that because it's a bad thing, but it's both. It's a good thing and a bad thing. Let's take distractible and unfocused, because that's ADHD. It goes with curious and exploring. Wouldn't it be good to encourage your kid to be more curious and more exploring? Give them more opportunities to expand and look for other opportunities instead of saying, why don't you narrow it down and focus in? There's strengths you can turn up the volume on. It's going to turn up the volume on the weaknesses at the same time, but that's okay. What makes us weird makes us wonderful. If we believe that, we get weirder. What makes us weak also makes us strong. If we believe that, we get weaker in order to get stronger. The next step is alignment, and this is what some of you are worried about. You're like, yeah, but Dave, to succeed in school, kids have to fix certain weaknesses. To succeed in work or to achieve my goals, I have to fix certain weaknesses, and you're not wrong about that. What I'm telling you is that maybe your goals should be different. You should change your destination instead of trying to change yourself. I have six years of, of, of education in psychology, an undergraduate degree, and a graduate degree in psychology. Here's what I learned, and I'll share it with you very quickly and save you a lot of money. People don't change that much. That might be hard to accept, so let me give you one example from my grandparents. My grandparents lived to be 95 years old. They were married for 70 years. They got married at the end of World War II. They lived together for 70 years. I saw them the year before they died. I went to visit them when I was on a trip, and my grandma complained to me that my grandpa didn't talk to her enough. After 70 years, my grandma still thought she was on the verge of a breakthrough with grandpa. <laughs> And Grandpa had the same thing. If you watched him, he was just being quiet about it. He's like, maybe if I stay really quiet and really still, she won't see me, and she'll shut the hell up and leave me alone. Right? Neither one of them could accept that after 70 years, the other person was not just about to change. Right? That it wasn't going to happen, that they needed to go ahead and accept the other person for who they were. Right? And so we don't do that. We live in a world that says, it's going to change, it's not. So it's far easier to change your destination to, than to change who you are. I wanted to be a professional football player. I wished when I was a kid my dream was to be in what just happened in downtown Nashville. I wanted to be in the NFL draft. Here's the problem with that. People tell you you can be anything you want to be, and you think you're being encouraging when you say that you're not. It's the worst lie you could tell any child. I graduated from high school. I was 6'4", 140 pounds. Can anybody tell me why I couldn't? It wasn't a belief. It wasn't a belief. It wasn't, well, if you just believed, if you just wanted it, if you believe it, you can 
achieve it. There's no amount of human growth hormone. There's no amount of steroids that turns a 6'4", 140-pound person into a professional football player. I was not able, no matter how much I wanted it. Does that make sense? There are limits. Well, and, if, and if you tell your kids there's no limits, then when they can't achieve certain things, they're going to feel like the problem is with them instead of the reality is that sometimes people just sort of can't do certain things. It just isn't what they're designed for. What you want to help kids to find is that there's no limits to your happiness, there's no limits to your success, but there are limits to specific things that you will not be able to do that you are not designed for. Success in life is helping our kids find out what were they made to do and helping them find the way to do it. Matching who they are to where they are. So let me give you an example. So when I was a kid, um, we were poor, and not only did my mom cut my hair, but they sent me to school with pants that were too short because I was growing too fast, and then when I would get holes in the knees from being hyperactive, they put patches on them. And so when I was 12 years old, I got a paper out and delivered newspapers at 5 o'clock every morning. And one morning, I fell off my bike, and I broke my left arm in half. Broke my arm completely through, came up at a 90-degree angle to the rest of my forearm. They didn't want to do surgery because I was so young, so they put me in traction, and they put me in a cast up to my shoulder for three months. They took the cast off after three months. They did do physical therapy. They told me I'd be fine. I went through um, uh, eighth grade and all the way through 12th grade. I got a college scholarship for basketball at a very small school because of how skinny I was. But I got a college scholarship, and I thought I was a normally functioning person. I was, I was an athlete. I was a college scholarship athlete. And when I was in college, I was 20 years old. It was eight years later. And my friend Carl was playing the guitar. And I was like, hey, Carl, show me how to play the guitar. That'd be awesome to play the guitar. So he hands me the guitar. I grab the guitar. I start trying to play the guitar. But I can't put my fingers on the strings the way he's telling me. And at some point, he just gives up on me because he thinks I'm an idiot. I thought, well, I guess I just can't do this. And he came over and he grabbed my hand. And he tried to physically put my fingers on the strings. And it was in that moment we realized they put me back together wrong at the hospital when I was 12. You should be able to do this. It's called supination where you put your palm flat to the ceiling. This is called pronation when you put your palm flat to the floor. I can do pronation with my left arm, the one that I broke, but I cannot do supination at all. And the reason that's crucial is because to play the guitar you have to turn your hand inside out and I can't even turn my hand over. And it was in that moment at age 20 that I realized why I had struggled at the drive through for so many years. I thought all of us were struggling at the drive through I thought it was a common human experience. I thought an amazing entrepreneur like one of you was going to figure it out and fix it, but it turns out I'm the only one struggling because I can give them the money just fine, and then they're going to give me the change, and I'm like, ah. And they're like, sir, you need to turn your hand over, and I'm like, okay. you got to reach it out. I'm like, what's reaching it out? My sister had a great idea where we said you need to get a basket on a stick and just put it in there. I just, yeah. But it gets worse. <laughs> Ten years ago I was training for a marathon and I got hit by a truck that was going 50 miles an hour. He hit me so hard in the left elbow that he was going 50 miles an hour. He hit me so hard he didn't break the bones, he sheared them off. So they took two gigantic screws, they did surgery this time, and they screwed them all the way through my left elbow. And they're still in there, and that's what holds my left elbow together today. And we did very extensive and very painful physical therapy for six months, and yet I'll never be able to extend my left arm fully again for the rest of my life. So I'm tall, we've talked about that, but I'm tall in the sense that a Tyrannosaurus Rex is tall. <laughs> <laughs> that you would expect from a person of my height. <laughs> So one of the things I get to do uh, next week, I'm going to New Zealand, uh, and that's because I've spoken in Australia about 15 times over the last 15 years. And one of the unusual things about Australia is they drive on the left-hand side of the road. And because they drive on the left-hand side of the road, the steering wheel in their car is on the right-hand side of the car. In America, we drive on the right-hand side of the road, so the steering wheel's on the left-hand side of the car. Does anybody know the first place that I drove when I drove in Australia for the first time? You're damn right I went to McDonald's, right? Because I wanted to know what it felt like to reach my right arm out of the window, fully supinated, perfectly extended, and bring that chain safely back into the vehicle, like all of us been taking for granted for so many years. Right? Now, we'll get to that story in a second, but I do want to share one thing with you. So one year I was traveling on February 14th, and so I had to get my wife a Valentine's Day card early, and I do my T-Rex story. I have a T-shirt with a T-Rex on it. It's become sort of the symbol um, for who I am. And so I was looking for cards, and normally I just settle, let's be honest. Like, I look and I look and I look, but finally I'm like, is it just going to be okay um, and not stupid? Uh, but this year I found the perfect card 
Um, and here it is. It says, uh, I love you this much. And she says, that doesn't seem like a lie. <laughs> <laughs> You're smarter than some girls. There's been a few times people are like, I don't know. I, you know, I have to like, tell them. It's like, I love you this much. You like telling your wife, I love you this much. Right? <laughs> But anyway, what's the moral to that story? The moral story is this, right? When I'm in America, I function very poorly in the drive-thru. When I'm in Australia, I function perfectly. But I'm still disabled in two different ways when I'm in Australia. I function perfectly not because I fixed my disability, but because I changed the situation. Situations are powerful. They can either put the spotlight on the best things about you or the worst things about you. But what we need to stop doing is trying to change who we are and change where we are. I haven't changed myself, I've changed the situation in Australia. I haven't changed who I am, I've changed where I am. I haven't changed the person, I've changed the place. And now I'm functioning perfectly when I used to function poorly without changing anything about myself because I found a situation that puts a spotlight on the best things about me. I think our job is to turn into situations that put the spotlight on the best things about them. The problem is, for most of us, school is one kind of situation that goes from kindergarten to 12th grade. It doesn't change and it doesn't have very many options. And even a private school is usually just a very similar version to the structure and the system of a public school. And unless you send your kid to a drama school or a music school or some cool school that significantly deviates, like a Montessori school or something like that, your child isn't being put into a situation that if they didn't match there, it doesn't match them at all. And when you fail early on in school, you think you're going to keep failing for your whole life because we think something's wrong with the kid instead of there's a bad match between who they are and where they are. And that's my challenge you today. When you're not working, when your spouse isn't working, when something about your kid isn't working, to stop thinking you're going to change the person and ask yourself, wait a second, how can we change the situation or find a new situation that would help them to succeed? Where do they succeed? And you might think that's a little extreme, so I'll even give you one that's even more extreme. There's a guy who started a company called Specialist Stern in Denmark. His name was Thorkil Son. They do software testing. And what he realized is software testing requires two things from an employee, hyper-focus and doing the same thing over and over again. But here's why he started the company. Because he also noticed that his son, who had autism, had two symptoms, hyper-focus and doing the same thing over and over again. And he put the two pieces together. He said, wait a second. Instead of getting my son therapy to be normal, Instead of thinking something's wrong with my son because he loves to be focused on one thing and do the same thing over and over again, now that I know that this is true, what if I created, forget, find the right fit? What if I created the right fit for my son? He built a company for his son and hired 49 other people with autism. They've been so successful with their business, not a nonprofit, not a government agency, not a charity, a business. They've been so successful that SAP, the global software giant, is looking for hundreds of people with autism from all over the world to do software testing for them. He proved that when you change the place, it seems to change the person. When you change who they are, you can't change who they are, but when you change where they are, it goes from people seeing them as having a disability to people seeing them as having a competitive advantage. They're better than everyone else when formerly they were seen as worse than everyone else. They see that weird is wonderful instead of something's wrong with me and constantly being judged against the normal characteristics that other people have. He did the best thing he could do for his son. He created the right fit for his son. You're entrepreneurs. You're not limited by just finding the right fit for yourself and for your kids. You can create the right fit. The problem is sometimes you created the business, it was a good fit, but now as it grows, it's not a good fit anymore because you're not a professional manager, you're a starter. So one of my cautions to you as entrepreneurs is make sure you don't build a business that becomes a business you don't want to be involved in anymore, but you feel pressure to change with it. There's nothing wrong with selling a company. There's nothing wrong with going back and starting a new company. There's nothing wrong with hiring people to manage the company you have. There's nothing wrong with saying, that's not my thing, I don't want to do that. Sometimes we create bad jobs for ourselves and then beat ourselves up for not being that kind of person. And we think of that as growth. If I was more of a professional, if I was a better person, if I could just evolve, there's nothing wrong with being a starter. There's nothing wrong with being an initiator. So how can you find the right fit? How can you help your kids find the right fit? The next one is avoidance. To be the best at some things, we have to be the worst at other things. We talked about Matthias Schlitt, but here's the more interesting part. He found alignment by finding arm wrestling. He amplifies by making his right arm that's already big even bigger, making the weird thing even weirder. 
by making his disability even more obvious, but he doesn't exercise the rest of his body. Does anybody know why? Why would he not exercise the rest of his body if he's an arm wrestler? You arm wrestle by weight class. You stand your entire body on the scale, and you arm wrestle against other people. This whole time I've been arguing, don't fix weakness, and here's a person who isn't fixing actual physical weakness. But there's a great reason for it. Because you stand your whole body on the scale, and then you arm wrestle against people whose entire body weighs the same amount as you. But once you're wrestling them, you're only using what? Your right arm. They're a well-balanced, well-rounded, normal-looking person, and they get whooped by him every time. But because in order to be a well-balanced and well-rounded person, there's no way all that weight on their legs is counting against them. All that weight on their arms is counting against them. All that muscle everywhere else in their body that makes them a normal person and helps them find a girlfriend counts against them when they're in arm wrestling. His success isn't just amplification. It's not just alignment with arm wrestling. It's avoidance. He deliberately do doesn't do things that everybody else thinks of as normal. And here's what I'm telling you. In your business, but also in our lives, we're all arm wrestling based on weight class. Some things matter a lot, and some things not only don't matter, they're a distraction, they're a problem when we try to focus on them. All right, so what should you stop doing? What should you let your kids stop doing? Uh, let's wrap it up with one more example. We need to partner with people who are strong or we're weak. The last part is if we're not gonna do certain things, we need to partner with people who are strong or are weak. Uh, Paul Orfel ran a company worth $2.4 billion and he couldn't read or write. How did he do it? By hiring people who could, right? It's obvious, but he paid people to do what he couldn't do. From age 5 to age 22, when you're in school, if you pay someone to do what you can't do, what's that called? <laughs> this is crucial. It's funny now, but for a kid, for a person who grew up, They've been taught for 17 years the worst, most unethical, immoral, disqualifying thing you can do is what? To get somebody else involved in doing your work. You have to be good at all the subjects, you have to be good at all the parts of all the projects, you have to know all the things, and if you're not, it's not just not appropriate, it's wrong to pay someone else to do it. And then from age 23 on, it's your best strategy for success, and it's called collaboration. So one of the reasons we don't partner with people who are strong or are weak is because we've been taught you can't partner with people who are strong or you're weak. You've got to be good at everything. But the other reason is because the people we need the most are the people we like the least. Remember my wife? She's always stealing my water and pissing me off. I know she's not here because my water still is. <laughs> Delicious and refreshing. So why are my wife and I still married after 24 years? Here's the rest of the story. She was in Guatemala on a missions trip, and my kids needed a couple of AA batteries, and I called up my structured and inflexible wife for $17 a minute on her cell phone. And I said, honey, where's the AA batteries? And she said, no problem. You go down the hall to the right, there's a closet, third shelf in the back, there's a plastic tub labeled batteries right next to a plastic tub labeled label maker. Um, <laughs> in the back, back of the last... That plastic tub label batteries is where we have double A's. Uh, we currently have five double A's. Three of them are Energizer, two of them are Duracell. Uh, be careful, one of the Duracells is rechargeable. And at that moment, I wasn't mad at my wife anymore. I was thinking to myself, I am so damn hot for you right now. <laughs> I can affiliate with my wife if I'm aware of her strengths and weaknesses, structure and flexibility, I accept that structure and flexibility are two sides of the same coin, and then I appreciate the structure and I stop trying to fix the inflexibility. And now I can partner with somebody who's strong or I'm weak, I can affiliate, and now I can have a more organized life without being more organized. I can have a more well-balanced and well-rounded life without being more well-balanced and well-rounded, only if I can be aware of, accept, and appreciate. Does that make sense? We can't do any of these different behavior steps until we can do any of the beginning steps, and that's why I encourage you with your spouse to do that assessment. Until you can see the upside of that thing that's frustrating you, until they can see the upside of that thing that's frustrating them, until you can begin to remember that that's exactly why you married the person in the first place, until you can connect those two things, you can't have that partnership that's going to be powerful and good for both of you if you're both waiting for their person to become more like you in the end. That's not the goal. Peter Drucker said organizations exist to make people's strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant. But I think families also exist to make people's strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant. I think the best marriages make people's strengths effective and their weaknesses irrelevant. So who's strong or you're weak? If you don't know, it's probably the person you like the least. 
So let's wrap it up with an example. This is the Leaning Tower of Pisa. If you're not sure what's wrong with it, it's Leaning. It's in the name. Uh, it was built in 1173, 846 years ago. But in the 1930s, Mussolini decided this was a national embarrassment for the country of Italy, and he ordered his government engineers to straighten it up. And they tried, and they failed. And that was a really lucky thing for the city of Pisa, wasn't it? Because millions of people have traveled millions of miles and spent millions of dollars to see a tower that leans. And if you don't believe me, tell me what this building is called. Exactly. <laughs> this is a beautiful building. This is very, very old, and it's not falling down, and no one cares. We crop it out like a bad ex-boyfriend in pictures. <laughs> you thought this Leaning Tower of Pisa was in a field all by itself, because that's what the pictures look like. And here's the moral of this story, though. We try to build kids like this. We try to build careers and businesses like this. We want schools and communities like this when what the world really values is this. And the people who run the tower now have finally figured that out. They said because of its inclination, the tower has become the object of very special attention. That's what I'm telling you today. In your marriage, in your parenting, in your business, it's going to be because of your inclination, because of your kids and your spouse's unique inclination, because of your inclination, because of your employee's inclination, that they'll become the object of very special attention, that their life, their work, will become the object of very special attention. They figured it out. They said it's important to keep the current tilt due to the vital role this element played in promoting the tourism industry of Pisa. That's what I'm encouraging you to do with your kids, with your spouse, with yourself, with your employees. Preserve the tilt. We live in a world that loves to straighten things up and straighten things out. And then wants to go see the Leaning Tower of Pisa. We have to be in the business of keeping the current tilt. The reason I'm so passionate about this and the reason I love EOers for not just focusing on business but focusing on relationships and not just focusing on relationships but focusing on their children is because this is my life's mission. It's for me, Cummings, he said, we do not believe in ourselves until someone reveals that deep inside of us something is valuable, worth listening to, worthy of our trust, sacred to our touch. And what I try to show people is that deep inside of them something is valuable. Probably the thing they've been told by their parents, teachers, and employers, and maybe even their loved ones is the most worthless thing about them. That it's worth listening to, that it's worthy of our trust, sacred to our touch. And I wrote a book called The Free Factor for Kids, and we have, we think, pretty close to one for each family, if you want to come grab one. Um, and that goes with the other book as well. And, and one of the reasons I wrote that is because I would talk to people about managing their business. I would talk to people about successfully managing people, and they'd come up to me and go, yeah, that's great, and I'm going to use that, but I've got a kid with dyslexia, ADHD, autism, they're being bullied, their sexuality is different than the other kids, what do I do? And so I wrote that book, I turned it into a children's book, I wrote, drew, drew pictures, I didn't draw pictures, I hired somebody to draw pictures. I told the story in a way kids could understand it, and this woman took it home to her son Leo, he just turned 16 today, we're still friends on Facebook, but he was 10 at the time, and she took it home to him, and he had ADHD, and he read the book, and he sent me a note, she brought it to me the next day, and he said, thank you Mr. Rendell for the book, it made me feel better about who I am. See, I was the first person in his 10-year-old life that told him that something, something deep inside of him was valuable, the very thing, his ADHD, that people had told him was the most worthless thing about him. That it wasn't worthless, that it was worth listening to, that it was worthy of our trust, that it was sacred to our touch. And that's what I want to help you with today. Hopefully you saw some things about yourself that you used to think weren't as good and you see that there's an upside in your spouse or partner that you didn't think were good and now you see there's an upside. But more so in your kids, maybe in your employees, and then you not only see that, but then you become a person who reveals to them the deep side, deep inside of them something's valuable, worth listening to, worthy of our trust, sacred to our touch, because what makes us weird also makes us wonderful, and what makes us weak also makes us strong. Thank you very much.